here's what's coming up on This Racing Life. If you've got two people fighting for the limelight, it just doesn't work. So you've got to, you've got to hide your ego, leave it in your tool bucket, and say, right, you've got to, you're the one to go to, and you know, we just sort of work away like that. I've definitely up, up my training. I've normally just sort of been ticking away ever since, but but when I heard that I'd be that I'd be getting the ride, I definitely did up my fitness just that little bit more. Twilight Sun himself, he improved 34 pounds from two to three years, so. Um, and his progeny certainly seem to be following suit. The American influence now coming into the sales is, is, is getting bigger and bigger. I mean, I think they bought over 60 yearlings last year in book one. He was part of the family, like properly. He was, uh, he was one of us. And, uh, you know, uh, nearly a year later, it's still hard to, uh, <laughs> to come to terms. Hi everybody, welcome along to the latest edition of this racing life. I've come up between the, the Loomer and the Hymer in picturesque Midland to Highbeck Lodge to catch up with some of Jed O'Keefe's close-knit staff. I started with Mickey Hammond. Um, I used to go during the summer holidays and um, well I actually started with Kate Milligan and when she went with Mickey as his, as his assistant I went with her during the summer holidays and then I started for Mickey in 91 and had a couple of years with him and then moved on to George Moore who recently retired and uh, spent 23 years with him. And then Jed and Andrea kindly offered me a job and I've been here, well I was only supposed to be here six months covering for Leanne and um, five years later <laughs> here I am still. I got into racing actually, a, a big, I started with Jed uh, when he was a livery yard and he actually worked assistant trainer for Mickey Hammond and uh, I read it in the, I think it was the horse and hound for a livery um, full time so I just thought hey I'll give it a go and then um, then Jed turned around and says that he's going to be a trainer now so let's uh, let's move forward and go into racing kind of by accident but hey it's worked out. On a daily basis I come in and um, I feed the horses first thing on the morning and then I'll go around and do any medical stuff that I can do before we ride out and just sort of get ahead of the game if we can and then we'll we'll ride out first lot and by that time Leanne's come in because obviously she has she doesn't come in until her child goes to school and then she'll take over a lot of the running of the yard because although we have the similar jobs one person's got to be in charge you know they can't and I go racing a lot so there's no point me there's no point me doing it and then so we just leave it to Leanne she, she's great at organizing runs the show and I take a step back and and hide away somewhere. <laughs> no, I'm only joking, but it's you know it's it, it works well. We have a good understanding, myself and Leanne working together, and and just you've got to be aware when you're working with a team of kids like ours. They've got to know a structure of command, and if you've got two people fighting for the limelight, it just doesn't work. So you've got to you've got to hide your ego, leave it in your tool bucket, and say right, you've got to you're the one to go to and you know we just sort of work away like that. In total I've worked for Jed now I think it's 15 years but I have had a, a bit of a break in between. I wanted to learn every every part of the, the industry so I went to be a, a secretary, a travelling head girl, a head girl elsewhere, learn different things, how different people do it and then for some reason I ended up back here. I, I still work 40 hours a week but I am I'm not here the whole time that the other staff are so when they go home at half 12 um, I finish at half two which means I have a two two hours on my own to do medicals or you know just w quietly work away there. They're a great team and you know Jed and Andrew create that because they're really good people to work for they look after as well they make sure we have everything that we need as you've seen by all the facilities that we have now and you know they've created a really good team you know led by myself and Leanne and then everybody else you know seems to follow along well and you know we've got a good bunch of young staff who are keen and, and want to do you know they want the horses to do well but also you know they look after them well they want to win all the best turnouts that they can get and you know and I don't think you can create that you, you can't um, it's a, it's something you can't fake you know you've that keenness and that want to do well you know you've got to have it in you and you know we're lucky enough to have a group of group of young people that have that We've got a great family. It's not just a team, it is a family. We, we all have each other's back. There's a lot of socialising going on out of work. There's, they're not just work colleagues. Great bunch of guys and friends. Lifelong friends, really. We're just on a bit of a real rebuild mission at the moment because we've lost a lot of our better horses all in one go. You know, some have retired and moved, you know, moved on to pastures new and they're hard to replace. So we've, we've, got, we've got some nice horses at the moment, but we're just looking for that next Sam Spinner or 
that's it. And we're hoping that something like a salsada, if we can get her to go in the stalls and stuff, then if we can get that right, then she could be the next, you know, she could be the next cab off the rank to, to take us to that next level. Another member of the Jed O'Keefe team is Sophie Scott, who is currently pupil assistant and on the road to becoming a trainer herself one day. I get to ride out, follow the horses, uh, watch them on the gallops, um, assist Jed, also help with the vet and communicate between the vet and Jed um, and do some admin side of things as well. I started riding lessons when I was about um, eight years old, um, back at home in Hamilton and um, then I actually done some work experience at Linda Perrich Racing Yard in uh, East Kilbride um, and that probably sparked the love for racing. After the experience at Linda's I decided to go to the British Racing School. Um, I was there for nine weeks and then they placed me at Mark Johnson's Yard um, and I think from the minute I came here I really enjoyed it um, and loved the surroundings and to be honest I don't think I'd ever leave Yorkshire. I got promoted to yard manager at Mark's, assistant manager and then yard manager and they nominated me for the um, David Nicholson Newcomer Award in 2019 and yet got into the top three and then won that in February 2019 um, and yeah that was a really great experience. Um, the, the awards was great and um, from that, that award the prize was to go to Dubai um, for five days and uh, yeah that was another really great experience. I was working for Bishops and Vets who are the local equine vets here. Um, they come to a lot of the yards in Midland which was actually quite a nice way to see how more of the yards in Midland function and what they do um, and also to expand my veterinary knowledge um, to then help me progress into this job at Jed's here. Amateur jockey Bailey Burns Lewis has been at Jed's yard for four years and is about to ride in his first ever race. I went over the card yesterday uh, I've spoke to my assistant trainers, Tim and Leanne, who were ex-jockeys in their time. And uh, I've just spoken to uh, the stable jockey there, Jack Garrity. So all's, all's well at the minute, but I can probably guarantee on race day tomorrow that the nerves will be high. I've definitely up, up my training. I've normally just sort of been ticking away ever since, but, but when I heard that I'd, be, that I'd be getting the ride, I definitely did up my fitness just a little bit more. Uh, so what, what I'm doing is I've got a dual purpose amateur licence. So that allows me to go on the flat and over jumps. And then hopefully if all as well as, a, as an amateur jockey, I'd like to get a conditional licence out. Um, so yeah, I would, I would like to make a length of career a bit if I can. From, from the minute I arrived, you know, I was, I was only 16 at the time. So, you know, moving, moving away from home, especially at a young age, is, is a big step to take. But Jed and Andrea made me feel welcome. The whole team made me feel welcome. And before I went to the racing school, I'd actually, I'd actually hardly sat on a horse. I couldn't really ride. So I learned how to ride at the racing school. My mother's always had horses, but you know she's never really done anything with them. They've just sort of been, been pets. Um, but I mean, I, went, I used to go to the racing school one day a week from, from school, and I took a really big interest in it. And that's where I, that's what I pursued after I finished after I finished my time at school and done my GCSEs. I went over to the racing school and yeah, I fell in love with racing ever since. Edgar Allan Poe. Here's the first, the load goes in with a blindfold, draws in, drawn in stall number two, Ed Gallon Poe. They're off, racing over a mile and a half, and Dream Point was the last one to depart the starter. One more Sue, also a little on the sluggish side, and breaking the line is Kapler Lass. So Leigh Fremantle is the one on the extreme outer as they work their way up the straight, going through the first of 12 furlongs. Kapler Lass is just off the leaders. Edgen Allen Poe and then Kuda Gold. They follow, then make a spark, being chased by Never Surrender. Win Fowler, Framley, Garth O'Reilly's pass. Point of honour back in mid division. There's a break of several lengths to the last three. Murchison River, Dream Point, and one more Sue of that trio as they come up towards the winning post. And here, Big Bad Boy has now just strode into the lead. Big Bad Boy around that turn goes about two or three lengths clearly Fremantle is wide on the track about four wide as they make the run towards the far side Edgar Allan Poe still there to the inside in the blue and yellow silks Kapler last not too far off and then Kuda Gold back in mid division with Maker Spark is never surrender Lay Fremantle's lost a few spots having taken the wide course Framley 
Lee, Garth, Wynn, Fowler, Kapler last. They are next. Then O'Reilly's pass, followed by Dream Point. And they move on down the far side with less than seven furlongs to go. They're well spaced out. The two who have virtually tailed off a losing touch of Murchison River and one more Sioux. Three quarters of a mile left to run. A big bad boy now being passed for the lead by Cuda Gold. And it's the AJ Novice Flat Amateur Jockeys Handicap. After the front two, Kapler last, dark blue jacket. Edgar Allan Poe sitting to the inside. Make a spark, green colours. Kapler last, never surrender. They're not too far off them. Then Win Fowler, point of honours, hidden to the inside. Dream Point has passed horse is steadily having been detached early and now they're making the run away from the back straight towards the final half mile it's Cuda Gold who has got the lead Cuda Gold and Jessica Betty moving on by about three lengths on the descent to the turn from Big Bad Boy second place make a spark Edgar Allan Poe Win Fowler is following that's the grey they have three furlongs left to go they're about to turn into the straight and it's Cuda Gold from Big Bad Boy Edgar Allan Poe make a spark Win Fowler Blue Jacket a point of honour Dream Point and Violet Barton to the wide outside, making progress in the predominantly white jacket. Uh, further back to Never Surrender. Kapler Lass has lost ground, then Framley Garth, followed by O'Reilly's pass, and now they make the run to the final furlong and a half. The one to catch is Cuda Gold. Now, Cuda Gold has got about a length and a half on them. Here comes the grey win Fowler, Edgar Allan Poe, point of honour up the inside, charging home. On the wide outside is Dream Point. Inside the final 150 yards, win Fowler, Edgar Allan Poe, and Dream Point over the top in the hands of Violet Barton, and it is Dream Point. Point from Winfola. Dream Point beats Winfola. Edgar Allan Pope. Not a bad start there. So jumped out the gates, lovely. Had a nice draw, was drawn to. I got a lovely pitch throughout the whole race. Uh, shook him up, shook him up just on the final bend, turn for home. And then after that, I just sort of got my head down and drove, and he took me every step of the way. How different is it riding in a race to riding up the gallops? Riding in a race, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot more active. There's a lot more going on. You've got to be a lot more aware of your surroundings. Um, it's, it's quicker, you know, a little bit more professional and. It's a lot, a lot different to the gallops, most definitely. Twilight Sun had a lot of success on the racecourse and is now proving to be a star in the ranks too for all at Cheveley Park Stud. He's had a uh, leading British place second crop sire so far this year with 37 uh, individual winners. Was that expected or has that, has that been better than... Um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, we, we hoped you know we hoped that he would go on. At Twilight Sun himself, he improved thirty-four pounds yeah. from two to three years. So, um, and his progeny certainly seemed to be following suit. So, we certainly hope that will be the case. He had a good start last year. I think he had twenty-four or five individual first crop winners. But this year, they've really kicked on again. Sort of led by uh, the Philly Twilight Spinner, who won the Cecil Frail Stakes on the latest start by six and a half lengths. So they're really you know they're really sort of improving again from two to three years you know and, and and what are the the twilight so i know it's very you don't want to pigeonhole <laughs> stallions into a bracket like that but if you know if you could sort of sum up what they are like if if you can yeah they're, they're good, good strong horses they get they, they um good frame with a bit of scope and it, you know they do strength takes a little time for them to strengthen into the frame you know i think um which is why we're seeing them really improve as three-year-olds um but again they've got good temperaments very much like him very solid, likeable horses to be around, yeah. And the fact that he's a son of Kalaki in turn, a son of Pivotal, I suppose, is it's obvious that he'd come to be here. But then it's not, you know, you, you had to go and buy into him. Yeah, very much, yeah. yeah we bought into him after he'd won uh, at York, a handicap at York, and uh, we, we uh, bought him off his owner breeder, Mr Wilson. And um, on his very first start, he, he thankfully won the Sprint Cup at Haydock. So uh, straight away, he was eligible, you know, became a stallion. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's uh, good enough to be a stallion for us. Yeah. That was a risk that, that paid off. Yeah, handsomely and very quickly, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and I suppose there have been a few of those. If you, you know, if you look at the, the calibre of stallion that you've got standing here now, you must be pretty happy. Yeah, we are. Yeah, they're all Group 1 winners and, you know, um, and Mason was obviously, you know, he won the July Cup there, which is a proven to be a stallion making race. You know, the likes of uh, Cadogeno, Green Desert, Oasis Tree, we've all won it in the past. Mm. We've got a great record of uh, producing stallions, yeah, yeah. And if any of them go on to be the next pivotal happy day? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> one and half as good would be happy, yeah. Watership Down Stud will also be hoping for big things in the sales this year, with a lot of promising yearlings on offer. We've got an incredibly good bunch of um, yearlings to sell this year um, in book one and book two, and we'll be selling some horses in Ireland this year as well. Um, but, um, you know, we've got a real spread. I mean, we've got some um, 
Somi Dar's got a very, very nice uh, See the Stars cult. Um, the Fugue's got a very nice Shamadal cult. Uh, we've got an exceptional Dubawi cult out of attraction for the Duchess of Roxburgh. Um, we've got a very nice Dubawi cult out of Jay Wonder, belonging to Andrew Rosen. Um, Trevor and Livy Harris are sending us a very nice Dubawi cult out of Bound. Um, mm. We've got a Frankel Colt out of Woodland Aria of um, Robin Geffen. Um, there's a there's a really top bunch of horses we've got to go to the sales this year. And we've obviously had the challenges of COVID having impacting you know, business and, and the likes, but the sales have been pretty strong. We've seen the Breeze Up sales recently. Mm. Even the National Hunt sales are very strong. Are you confident going into this year after what's been quite a tough time of things for most people? I don't know. I mean, I, I think... Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different things going on and different pressures on the market at the moment. I, it's it's been exceptional what has happened, and that the market, the resilience the market has shown um, during this COVID time. Mm. Um, but obviously, the um, the sad death of um, Sheikh Hamdan is 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 going to affect the market. I mean, he's a most incredible supporter mm. of of horse racing in general and, and amazing at the sales. I mean, I think he bought, I think he bought a horse off us nearly every year since right. we started. And he's, he was an exceptional man and he had a really, really good team and Angus Gold just did a brilliant job for him over the years. So he's a massive loss to the industry. Um, and hopefully the family will continue to, to, to buy um, some yearlings. Um, but no, I think that the American influence now coming into the sales is, is, is getting bigger and bigger. I mean, I think they bought over 60 yearlings last year in book one, and they're all performing very well over there. Mm. And turf racing is becoming more and more popular in America. And I, I, I believe that um, actually there's now more turf racing than dirt racing in America in, in prize money terms. So um, I think there are a lot of different buying groups out there mm. who are looking to buy um, European based bloodstock. So, I, you know, we've got to be hopeful. You talk about a lot of the clients that you have here standing their mares as well, because this is a, a business that, you know, always wanting to sort of make money and, and sort of reinvest back in. And how important is it to have a, a list, a big suite of other clients and their mares here that you can work for and produce good yearlings that go to the sales? Well, it's fantastic, and we are really, really fortunate to have some wonderful people who have, have mares with us both here at Watership Down and in Kiltynan in, in, in Ireland. And, um, yeah, I mean, we, we want to do by, the best by everybody and um, breed the best possible horses we can. So, as we said, we've gone through this, the, the, the background and the history of Watership Down and Kiltynan, which became sort of part of this, the fabric of it all sort of later on. What was the ambitions there to sort of add an Irish arm to what always, already is quite a big, big Well, the, the, In fact, Kiltynan was bought um, pretty early um, on uh, in, in the whole story. And um, it was bought, Andrew um, and Madeline actually, Andrew saw it, at, when I got married to, to, to Jane, my wife, whose parents live on the next door farm, and, and the lady who owned, the, owned Kiltynan gave me a lawn meet the day um, we were getting married. Anyway, Andrew was there and he saw it, and, and it's the most beautiful place. And, and, and the following year, um, the lady who owned it, McGee White, she, she sadly died. And um, Andrew asked me if there was a chance we'd be able to buy it. And so, anyway, Jigs and Rose, we bought it. and. We didn't really need it at the time. And um, in fact, Coolmore um, had it leased, the, f the farmland leased for mm. a couple of years. So, so they continued leasing it for a couple of years. And then we slowly, slowly built it up. But it took a long, long time. And we've done it very slowly. And um, the business there has increased. And um, you know, now there's probably 350, 400 acres of rail paddocks there now. And um, it is the most beautiful stud farm. And a lot of your mares, you said uh, the fugues there at the moment, Dare Me, and, and it means that you can leave them there and they can be covered by the sires that are over there as well. And there's a big 
sort of for you is there a big you know you want to support as many sires across UK and Ireland or is it you know the what's best for that mayor whichever year year it is yeah I think the, the you know the mayors get bred to whoever we think is the right horse to breed them to but we're we're obviously incredibly lucky we're right next door to mm. Coolmore in in Feathered and um, the Equine Hospital which is world class is in Feathered so we've got all that fantastic um, veterinary side which is which is so important um, and we've got access to to wonderful standards not only at Coolmore but at Bally Lynch and at the Irish National Stud and at Gilltown um, and uh, Yeomanstown so no and we can um, we walk all the horses in from from Kiltine into those studs. Yeah brilliant so uh, looking ahead looking to the future you, we've been nearly 30 years your association here at um, Watership Down um, I read that it was 93 that you might have it, it might, might have, have been yeah I mean it sounds amazing yeah. but it's probably true but anyway. And you've now you know probably exceeded your expectations of now having associated with a sire such mm -hmm. as Two Down Hot you've got all of his progeny to look forward to are there, are there any more goals and targets that you yourself and the Lloyd Webber set looking ahead to the future? I think um, the one thing about this business is you can never you can never rest still you've got to always be moving forward so yeah so there's always things that we will be trying to achieve and try and do um, but I think one of the most important things is that when we set this whole thing up we we wanted to ultimately have 10 mares the Lloyd Webbs well they've actually got about 14 okay. it's still very small and I think um, one of them, I think a really, really important part of it is to not allow it to get too big from mm -hmm. their point of view. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, the, both the studs have got a lot of mares on them um, for clients, but Watership Down itself needs to remain a very tight, very, very high class quality broodmare band. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't want to get carried away and start having loads and loads of mares that don't meet the, the quality that we need to we need to have and and have here at Warship which has been so important to building the farm up to this to today. And ultimately that's you know why there's been so much success is being quite conservative quite strict with uh, how you sort of keep this place going it has to be those original ambitions that are set just have the have the quality and, and not sort of try and get too carried away. Yeah, it's it, it, it's 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 really important, and you know we 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 set out to have a number of mares, and I think that you know we've obviously been outstandingly lucky to end up having Dorara and that extraordinary family, um, and I think any farm is is lucky to have one family, mm. not two or three or four, um, however big you are, whether you're, um, you know, all the bigger operations, you know, you can always kind of work out two or three key families that are very, very prevalent in all their pedigrees. Um, so the, the Dorara family is, I think, going to obviously ultimately be the most important part of Warship Down, and we need to really nurture that. David Menwissier has enjoyed a lot of success over the recent weeks, but there is one horse that will always have a special place in his heart. He was part of the family, yeah. like properly. He was, uh, he was one of us. And, uh, you know, uh, nearly a year later, it's still hard to, uh, <laughs> to come to terms with the fact that he's not here. You know, despite... Um, <clears throat> despite Wonderful Tonight, despite all the others, he will always be, he will always have a special, special place here. I see him everywhere. Do you? Just yeah. memories? Yeah. You know, there's, a <clears throat> there's not a part of Cumlands where I can't see him, you know, even now. Are you proud of what you, him, everyone did together? Ah. Uh, Awfully proud, you know, I mean, all the trips we've had, you know, that trip to York. The horse, I mean, he ran a blinder, I mean, he's, he ran second. He, he must have made up about 20 lengths in the last furlong and a half of the race. 
And I was so angry. I was proud I of him, but I was so angry, you know, because he so deserved to win. And I came home, I was like, oh, who's that bloody horse? Who's that bloody horse who managed to beat it? And it was Yukon, <laughs> Yukon Glen. And uh, with hindsight, <laughs> it was such a performance, you know, to make up 15, 20 lengths on yeah. Yukon Glen. You know, imagine, that was extraordinary. But that day, I rang Clive, I mean, Clive wasn't there, so I, Clive Washburn, the owner, and I said to him, look, I'm fed up. I can't run this horse in handicaps anymore. He just has too much to do. We need to stick him in a, in a stakes race yep. and expose him and see how good he is. Because we know he's much better than what he's doing now. And I got seriously offended by getting beat in the John Smith's Cup, I have to admit. And um, so that's when I decided to enter him for the, um, the York Stakes two weeks later. And that was someday. I mean, it was my first, uh, first group winner. Mm. Uh, we had won a listed race before in France, but that was my first group winner. Yeah. And my gosh, you know, when you have a good, a good day at the races, I always feel that I'm seeing the race in slow mo in my head and the last furlong, you know. And when he got checked one and a half out, and I thought, ah, that's it. He, he won't come back from that against this yeah. opposition. He can't. And he just did. And he came back and put his neck on the line, literally. And I was surrounded by, I don't know, 20, 30 people. Mm. And they all came at the same time to tap me in the back and cheering and I was, it was just a, a, an incredible feeling. When you go into your office, obviously wonderful tonight, there's plenty of coverage, pictures and so on, but she, she's not going to win the battle for wall space completely, is she? Because Thundering Blue is still very much there. And yeah. um, do, you, do you allow yourself to get nostalgic and watch back the performances even now? In the winter? Yeah. In the winter we do, yeah. Winter is our downtime. I don't race much on the old weather. Um, I have nothing against it. I just feel that everybody needs a break, whether it's the horses, the staff, myself. And so it's our downtime. I try to be old fashioned and, and uh, try and resource um, ourselves, you know, in the winter. Mm. So that's the time when we do end up watching replays and yeah, and uh, yeah, Thundering Blue is uh, amazing. That's it for this series of This Racing Life. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>